Hey, in this episode of the podcast, I get to sit down with fine art photographer Tony Kewitt. We talk about his approach to light, education, and the reason why. Hey, Tony, welcome to the podcast. How's it going? Really good, Frederick. Thanks for having me, although it's nice and early here. The sun's not up, but I'm looking forward to a good day and looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, good. You got your coffee or your tea or something over there for I, the caffeine? I, I have a nice uh, little cup of tea, actually. I haven't drunk coffee in six months. I've kind really? of gone off coffee. Yeah. Oh, oh blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I loved my coffee for 40 years, and uh, yeah, I just, I just thought I'd try something different, and I've been off it for a while. I'll probably go back one day, but... Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. something different. Okay, so in that inter- the little intro that folks have just heard, I you know talked a little bit about your background and you know all the amazing things that you've been up to. Let's <laughs> let's dive in a little bit deeper, right? Sure. So you, as we were talking about before we started recording, there's you have a lot of different ways that you contribute to the photography world or the world at large, but you know, influencing and educating photographers. Why, why educate photographers? You know, why not just shoot and, you know, go out there and create the images that you love creating? What drives you to teach? Great question. I, I think, I think people in photography, like people have to remember that just cause you're a photographer doesn't mean that you're not something else. And, um, for me, you know, I've always been, I'm the oldest child of an oldest child. I've found that uh, over the years, I've always wanted to pass on what I know. So it's a natural, you know, I played sport, I would be captain of the team, or I'd be on a committee, I'd end up being chairperson of the committee, um, things like that. So for me, it was a natural as a, as a growing up as an oldest child, you always were put in positions of responsibility and that in position of responsibility also entailed sharing or passing down the knowledge. I also find that when you teach or when you share what you know, you you are privy to or give an opportunity to know more. Where that comes from, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a spiritual person in some ways. And for me, like standing on stage talking, some of what I say comes out of my consciousness or my brain or you know, what I'm thinking. And other stuff, I have no idea where it comes from. So I think the feeling that comes from that and the energy that flows through you when you're sharing is, is it's a bit like a drug, you know, like it just, I love the feeling that I get from watching someone else have an aha moment. Yeah, that's great. That's that. And that's, I don't know, it's just the, the idea, and you tell me if this is true, when you are instructing someone, you become closer to the subject that you're teaching, or you get to see it and, and understand and understand it in different ways. Is that true? Absolutely. I think when we're, when we're a practitioner and we, um, you know, executing with our craft, we're taking pictures, often we're doing it sub- subconsciously, subliminally, a lot of the knowledge, we're on autopilot. But when we have to teach, we have to go back and we have to bring it back through our conscious mind so that we can communicate what we're doing. And in so doing, we kind of fill in the gaps of things we might be taking shortcuts on or not quite doing as well, and we become a little bit better at what it is we're teaching. Yeah. You know, and with, with that, I mean, like, like we were talking about before, there's so many different ways that I could take this interview. I want to, I want to go down the route of just sort of speaking to two different audiences in this, in this particular episode, right? So we're, let's speak, let's speak to the photographers themselves and let's, you know, mostly an audience of accomplished photographers. And then let's also speak to the folks that are maybe not at that level yet. So Sure. You know, and I know you speak to both groups with a plum, right? Yeah. So when you're when you're speaking to the folks that are, you know, hey, I'm I've been told I'm a good photographer, and I really want to make the leap into doing uh, a you know a Tony Hewitt level of photography if I can get close to that, or at least aim my vector in that direction. What advice do you give them in 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 order to start honing their own? skill set as a photographer or finding what their vision or their voice is so you, this is talking about the more you know established uh, practitioner someone who's been in the game and saying well what's the next level no let's take them back a level from that so okay. that, so this that is, this aspires is the... to get to that level okay i think i think keeping it simple is a key you know people often start off and get too complicated they 
worry about have I got the best gear, have I got the best software, do I know enough? I'm often t telling, you know, in sort of trying to encourage people that are starting out using Photoshop, for instance, or Capture One or Lightroom. You don't have to know everything. You just got to, you just need to know what it is you need to know to do what you want to do. Now, not everybody wants to create composites and stitches and stacks and, you know, complicated um, combinations of images. Some people just want to tidy up an image. So there's only, may only be a certain number of skills you need to learn. So first thing is keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it for yourself. Second thing is to sort of break it down. In, in photography, I, I believe, along with some of my colleagues, that there's, there's kind of three steps. Well, number two step is capture. And that's an obvious one. You know, you go out with your camera or your capturing device, whether it's a camera or drone or something, and you record what it is you want to, to show in a picture. And then there's the, ex the sort of expression of what you've captured, whether that's complicated expression, you know, abstracts and um, all sorts of trickery in Photoshop, etc., or just simple expression. But before the two of them comes vision. And you can learn to see or, or enhance and hone your sight says your vision purely by practice. It's just practice, going out, looking at things, getting feedback. And in the digital world, we're so so lucky because in the digital world, we have the chance for immediate feedback. And only yesterday, I was talking to somebody and they were, hadn't done their homework <laughs> that I'd given them about four weeks ago. And I sat down and we're at their desk in their office and he's the, he owns the company. So I pulled his phone out and I said, show me a photo you took in the last week and let's just edit it on your phone and then let's pop it up on one of your social media things. Oh, I haven't got time. I said, let's do it. And it took us four minutes. Yeah. And I said, he said, but that's not the quality of work I want to produce. I said, that's fine, but we just practice your vision because we did a bit of a cropping. You had to look at about six frames and pick the one that thought you thought did it right. So I think keeping it simple practicing all the time you know uh, you take a top nba basketballer nfl footballer they walk around with a football on the weekend they take their basketball and bounce it down to the shop you know so it's practicing all the time irrespective of whether you're in the game or not and sight is something you can practice sitting on a bus stop and looking around and looking at the light never stop practicing so as a professional we don't need to keep getting better gear and the fact is, if you go back and look at some of your best pictures from 10 years ago, they're still good pictures. And they're not suddenly bad pictures because you weren't using the latest, you know. Can I mention a camera brand here? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, um, for me, it'll be phase one. Just because you're not using the latest, you know, IQ4 phase one on an XT camera doesn't mean it's now not a good shot. It's a good shot. And we go back and look through history. There's some fantastic shots. Maybe they're not quite as resolved as we get these days, etc. but they're still good shots. So it was the vision and the, um, the the ability to see something that other people walk past that made you a great or makes a great photograph. So you can keep practicing that. Now, the thing with those people that are considered to be at the other end of the scale or you know, well-established good photographers, they've honed that skill because we can all go and buy the same cameras. We can all download the same software and sit here and do tutorials and workshops and practice them. But sight, that's the key. I think you've yeah. got to learn that. And, and you can do that with anything. You don't, you don't even need a phone. I mean, you can sit there with a notebook and a pencil, as far as I'm concerned, and just jot down the things you like. I've traveled with artists, as in painters and things, for certain projects I've been involved in. And it's fascinating to watch an artist in the field when we're, we're out in the middle of you know, nowhere, middle of Australia, and they're walking around making shapes on a piece of paper. I said, what are those triangles on the roof? And he said, that's the, that's the shape of the light reflecting mm. off the roof. And I looked at the building that it was an old abandoned building and I looked at it and we could see these little, like little peaks of light. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And he said, yeah, I've got to see that first so that I can express it later. Yeah. And I think those starting out, that's it, practice. If you've got a phone, you may not want your final images on phones, but practice. And every now and then on my social media feeds, I'll, I'll put Tony Hewitt brackets iPhone. I want people to see I did a knife and, and interestingly enough, last Christmas I had a lady ring me. She said, I would like to buy a gift voucher for my husband. He loves your photography. I said, sure. And she said, but this may be a bit rude. I said, what's, she said, I don't want to insult you, but I'm wondering if I could buy three hours of iPhone instruction. And I thought, said, oh, look, I'm happy to teach whatever. That's interesting. She said, because he keeps getting upset every time he goes through, he sees your work and he knows you've got a good camera and all of that. And then every now and then you pop one in, it's got iPhone. He says, damn. How does he do that on a phone? <laughs> and um, I said, no problem. So I turned up, and when I got there, he said, look, I've got a couple of grandkids. Before we start, 
can you show me how to do a portrait? And all we did was spent two hours looking at the light. We took about three frames and he rang me back a few days later. He says, I am over the moon with what I learned in two hours. Learn to see. And you can start that any day you want. That's crazy. See that? All that right there is just, this should be, that's an article, right? About how to see, right? That's the whole thing. Well, transition that into, you know, take it personal, right? So when you're, if, if there's a collector, you know, let's call them an NFT collector, right? And they're looking at one of your pieces and they want to know, you know, what went into this? You know, who is this guy that's making this thing that I'm going to, you know, write this virtual cyber check to? Like, what what would you want those folks to know? Like the collectors in terms of your vision, your personal vision that went into that piece of work, you know, and someone that hasn't met you, but considering buying a piece of your work, whether it's an NFT or a print or something, what what little thing do you want them to know about you that comes along with that piece? There's a short answer and a long answer. And the short answer is something that took me about 15 years to, to understand. And that was someone asked me what was my art about. And mm. I remember thinking, well, gosh, I, I'm, you know, and I started talking and I thought, that's not it, that's not it. And it took me a while to condense it into the elevator pitch. And essentially my work is uh, an expression of my experiences when I witness the dancing between the water and the light. I'm a water person. I love the beach. I love scuba diving, I love fishing, I love surfing, I love water skiing, all of those things. So I love the water and I'm fascinated by light. I've been fascinated by light for as long as I can remember and that's starting to become quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So first thing I want people to understand is I'm sharing a unique experience that I have in a moment when I'm looking at light, interplaying, uh, dancing, interacting with something. Now for me, it's water. Now in terms of your art or my art, um, we each have a unique voice, Frederick, you know, and our voice and, and our way of expressing who we are as we move through this, this world, this experience on this planet um, is done in so many different ways. So, for instance, what clothes you wear, uh, how you style your hair, what jewelry you might put on, taking, you know, wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. It changes the way you're expressing yourself. When we talk, our tonality, you know, my voice probably sounds a little different because I have a slightly different accent, I'm mm -hmm. sure. So that that is an expression of who I am. And my artwork is a way of expressing how I feel about the, the things that I get to experience as I move you know, through this world. So I utilise photography. Some people write songs. Some people write poems. Um, some people write stories. You know, We all use different mechanisms by which we can uh, share our way of seeing the world and, and tell our stories. My pictures are my stories of how I've experienced that interplay between water and light. So I suppose when people look at the work, I'd like them to understand that there's several levels. One is the aesthetic. You know, I'm, I have a background that is, I'm, I'm quite stick, a stickler for, you know, geometry and balance and things like that. Not in a traditional one third, one third, one third, photography sense, but just in overall balance of what's within my frame. Then there's a harmony of colour, and sometimes a harmony of colour can be a disharmony for a deliberate reason, in order to evoke a response from the viewer that, geez, these colours are clashing, what does that make me feel or think about? Whereas, oh, these colours work so beautifully together, they're serene, they're soft, they're subtle, they're hard, they're hot, they're, you know, sensual, whatever it is. And then I look for... Um, Symbology in the land or, or shapes and, and, and forms within the land, particularly my aerial art, that will resonate with people for other reasons. So we have archetypal symbols. Simple archetypal symbols could include things like a cross, uh, a river, uh, you know, like a rolling hills, uh, perhaps a tree pattern. You know, see a lot of aerial photography involves estuaries and tidal plains where the waters drain out and you get those beautiful tidal patterns. And we look at that. And instinctively, human beings would look at that and go, that looks like a tree, but they know it's not. So we're now intrigued. So for me, the pieces of art that from a distance can be looked at and appreciated for their aesthetic beauty, their symbology, if you like. But then at a deeper level, it's, okay, this is one person's viewpoint. And we need to remember, you know, photographers of all levels, no matter whether they're starting out or they're at the sort of 40-year mark and they're still improving, that you take 
any digital capture, take any negative, there are a multitude of ways you can express what's on that film or what's on that file. In the same way that a conductor can walk in front of a 100-piece orchestra with a sheet of beautiful music and choose how to play that, how to express what that piece of music is trying to, excuse me, trying to say. Mm -hmm. So he, one conductor will walk in and say, right, I want this to be dramatic. I'm going to have the kettle drums come up loud. I'm going to have the, you know, the tubers and the, and the heavier horns really loud. And we'll keep the violins and the piccolos a bit quieter. I want some drama and I want a heavy sound. But the next conductor comes in with the same piece of music and says, no, I want this lighter. I want the trombones to come in a little bit less. I'd like the violins and the piccolos and the flutes to come through. And we'll keep the drums down a little bit quieter and play a completely different expression. And that's where we each get to say what we want to say. And that's why I'm never concerned about going to the same venue or, or going to the same place as other photographers because my experience is unique. So through my art, I can share what I experienced um, in, in the way that I feel best uh, portrays my unique experience. And hopefully that allows people permission to have almost a window into how I saw the world because none of us, as much as we can get around the world more now than the last few years, can ever experience everything there is to experience. Yeah. So through imagery, through photography, through NFTs and things like that, we have the opportunity to look into the world through the eyes of so many other people and have their guidance or their vision or their personal expression um, overlaid against that experience. Yeah. Do, do you find, I'm curious, uh, do you find that th the things that you were feeling at the time of capture or even post-processing in terms of your overall feeling of well-being or, you know, maybe something emotional is going on in your life at that given time when you're processing or shooting that photo or some song was playing at the time or in your head, you know, do those things get burned into the photograph, you feel like, you uh -huh. know, so when, whenever you pick up one of those photographs, you've shot, you know, tens of thousands of photographs. I'm, I'm guessing you could go back to any one of them and relive that experience, even in a small way. Do you find that to be true? Absolutely, Frederick. I think, yeah. like all things, we all remember, you know, well, most of us will remember our first kiss or something like that, and there might have been a song on the radio. 30 years later, the song comes on, you go back to that moment. And I think photography is very much like that. Uh, it's an interesting point you make about the what you're feeling as you shoot. And, you know, people, you know, I, I sit talking to photographers and they might sort of comment that they sit down, they look at their images from a shoot, from a workshop, from a trip, and they think, oh, I wasn't as excited. And I said, yeah, but remember, just remind yourself that there's a reason you pressed the trigger when you did. What's that reason? Go back to what that moment and why did you press it? And then it will unlock feeling. And if you edit with the feeling that you had at the time, you will take that image on a direction, like the conductor choosing which parts to bring out, um, that will more closely resemble the feeling. Because ultimately, why do we show someone our image? Why do we pick it up and, and say, hey, look at this? Whether it's a fixed, you know, like a hard copy image on a wall or, you know, or a digital image, why are we sort of asking people to look at it? But in a way, I think we're trying to transfer a feeling, transfer an energy that we have, and hopefully by, by looking at the image, through the image, they also tap into that feeling. And that's why when we edit with that in mind, whether it's, you know, I edit often with a glass of wine and some music, that will influence me. I sometimes um, have the music that I played on the trip, and I'll play that back. Uh, things that will put me in a space where I can forget about the immediacy of everyday living and go back into the wonderment of being able to just explore the world and then remembering that when we're, when we're editing, even if we're doing simple editing, you may not be a heavy sort of editor, you just like light retouch, um, corrections, etc. but just even the subjective decision of how much warmth do I bring back into the image, um, you know, how much vignetting will I put on this image? What's the overall darkness? What's the contrast I want to bring in? All of those things are being driven, we think, purely logically, but I believe that there's a health, there's a, there's a lot of emotional content or, um, you know, right brain that goes into that, and that is being driven by how you feel. How you feel at the time you're doing it is very important. And I look back on work that I did maybe 15 years ago, when, and it was just after digital started to really embed itself. And there was a lot of dark, moody types of, Grin, grungy. I think we were covering up for some of the inadequacies of digital at the time, but 
that sort of heavy muted color. And then I look at what I did you know, for the last maybe three, four years, and there's bright colors, you know, clear and and unafraid sort of loudness, if you like, mm -hmm. trying to say to people, I'm excited about what I can get now. So yes, I think our images are they're an ambassador for our feelings and they're an ambassador for our experience. And the challenge as a photographer is not so much to share the content alone. You know, here's a picture of what I saw, but to somehow massage that content and share it in a way and says, this is what I saw, but this is my unique experience and how I felt about it. Whether it's warming up a picture, cooling off a picture, you know, contrast levels, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so deep because then the other side of that literally is if at the point of capture all these subjective things and subconscious things go into the reasoning behind your composition and you know focal length choice and all that stuff right and when you when you click that button and then of course the post processing you fully you you further refine that but the other side of that coin i think is also the subject especially if you're a photojournalist right so you're all this math is going on in you when you take that capture but there's a lot of math going on in your subject as well that kind of meet together when you're feeling a certain way and you shoot someone who's you know feeling a certain way why did you shoot them all that stuff it's it gets pretty deep you know i'm i'm yeah. curious around your you know in, in speaking to you even just for these this short time i can tell that you have a love affair or a fascination with light right so explain that fascination because i have my own my own relationship with light i'm curious you know from your perspective what is it about light that fascinates you I, if I could, if I could explain that in a sentence, uh, I don't think I could do it justice. I, yeah. I've been fascinated by. I think, I think what fascinates me the most about light is that we get, we, we grow up, initially looking at the world in terms of its physical aspects. You know that everything has depth and height and width. You know, there's a there's a spatial awareness we develop it to different levels as we grow up. This is the world around me. This is what it looks like. And we forget sometimes that this is what it looks like right now in these conditions. Mm -hmm. And for me, and this is a bit of a jump, but for me, it can be a reminder that that's the entirety of our experience as human beings. Because as people, if somebody judged me on one experience, I'd feel that that's selling me short. And if I judge someone else on one experience, that would sell me short because in that one experience, maybe it was a bad day, maybe it was a good day. I don't know what, you know, you don't know, I don't know what happened to that person 10 minutes before. They may have just won the lottery. They may have found out a family member's very, you know, ill. So you don't know. And we look at a person in that instance and we think, I know them. Same as in photography, when we go out, whether we're photographing urban landscape or aerial photography or a sunset on the beach, if we judge that location, that place, by that one moment, we've sold it short because that location or portraiture, photojournalism, that person, we're seeing one facet of a jewel. Yeah. You know, um, people say, like we did a big project uh, a while back uh, called GURP IC, where myself and another colleague flew around the whole country of Australia, the whole continent, and followed the beach for 31 days in a four-seater plane eight hours a day in a very small plane with no cabin service and no bathroom. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. But if, and, and, you know, I, I, but one of the reasons I did that was because people used to say, oh, yeah, I've been to Australia, or, you know, Australia is this. And it's like, no, no. Or Australia's beaches are this. Well, I can tell you having seen every beach in Australia, literally, and probably one of very few people that have, Australia is a multifaceted jewel. And every beach is different. Now, the really cool thing that really does my head in is I saw each beach in a certain on a certain day at a certain time of day. So morning light, middle of the daylight, afternoon light, in certain weather conditions. And I could do that same trip a thousand times and have a thousand different experiences. So light is the key factor because morning light is different to the middle of the daylight. Um, hard light, soft light. Um, clouded days versus bright sunny days, warm light, cool light, 
uh, light reflecting off a water surface that's moving, white light reflecting off a calm surface, light reflecting off a wave that's breaking. Same space in time, same, same space on the planet, same physical area, totally different experience. That fascinates me. And it, it reminds me that each and every one of us, in any moment, we express ourselves in one way. But in any moment, we have an infinite ways of expressing ourselves. And I know I'm probably getting a little deep there, but that's what drives my fascination for light because I'm looking at it going, what other – I look at a location from the air, which is my passion you know, more recently and one of my specialties, and I look down and I go, what have you got to say today? And hmm. rather than you know the mentality of I've already been and photographed that location, I look forward to going back and going, well, what have you got to tell me today? And some of my collections, there are images in those collections maybe three years apart that are the exact same location, but they're different light, different time of day, and a different feeling comes out of it. And it's a reminder that every time we think we know the world or we know the world around us or we know the people near us, if you're a parent, we know a child, there's something we don't know. There's always another facet that we could probably go and explore. I love that. And that is really eye-opening because I've, I've, I've made the, the statement that, you know, I don't know if I could be a landscape photographer because I feel <laughs> like all the noteworthy places have been photographed already by people arguably better than I am. So why am I going to go there and redo it? And what you just said just basically added another dimension to that, right? The time dimension, mm -hmm. All of that stuff sort of factors in, notwithstanding, you know, we are ourselves an NFT of one, right? So, <laughs> you know, no yes, one's going to exactly. see it from my perspective, right? Exactly. That's right. Yeah. We are. Yeah. And as you said, we are unique. And I think it's that uniqueness that, you know, people need to, whether you're starting out in photography or whether you are um, been in the game for a long time and, you know, people get phased. You, you have those plateaus. We run out of inspiration and things, you know, go back. Go back to the favourite locations and don't be afraid to, you know, overwrite it. It doesn't demean, diminish or reduce the impact or the value of the original captures. It just means you've gone back to find another facet. Because, you know, I invite everybody listening to ask yourself, is there only one side to you or is there more to you? Has everybody out there seen everything there is to see of you or have you got more to share? And I firmly believe that all of us have so much more to us than most people know about us. We all have our, and I don't, you know, yes, we all have our secrets, but not so much the secrets. It's the, there's more to me than that. You know, there's more. And, and if somebody judges you, we feel like saying, there's more to me than that. That's not me. Well, imagine if landscapes had the opportunity to speak to you. Imagine if an urban scene had the chance to speak to you or your favourite beach that you've seen some sunsets. It might say to you, you might have thought you've seen a great sunset tonight, but come back next week. I've got some more. Mm -hmm. And for me, NFT is an opportunity to say this is one my ex unique experience. You just said, you know, going out and shooting landscapes for yourself. Well, you go back to those places. One thing I want you to remember, Frederick, when you turn up, you remind yourself that if a million photographers have stood there and taken that shot, you're one that hasn't. And that makes whatever you're about to do totally unique. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So then switch gears, you know, to sure. the... So we talked, we talked to the sort of beginning or, you know, mid to advanced amateur photographers that are searching for and finding their voice and understanding things. We talked a little about light and philosophy of light, psychology of what happens at the point of capture and all that. Now let's talk to those folks that are accomplished photographers, right? Yeah. They've found their voice. They're doing amazing work. They may have sold NFTs for eight figures, right? These are, these are people that are out there. Any advice that you could give them either you know, to increase the torque on what they're doing now or to shift gears into, you know, something else completely? You know, what are, what are your thoughts for those folks? Well, I, f I feel a little bit um, reticent to, to assume that I'm in a position to, to, start, <laughs> to yeah, start advising well. <laughs> people at that level. But, but sure. um, given the invitation, I, I suppose from my perspective, it's um, one of the things I think that's really important to keep the passion going and you know you can probably tell i get on a roll with talking because there's there are aspects of of our craft our industry that i absolutely love and one is sharing with others as you as you identified and the other is just being in the light and watching things but i think where i've 
where I've found myself plateauing is when I lack purpose. And I, and I think that's where the, um, the passion to share with others helps me have purpose, whether it's sharing through education, uh, whether it's sharing through inspiration. So a lot of the conferences I am privileged enough to be invited to talk at, I tend to not do the technical side, not that I'm not technical. Uh, I tend to get invited to do more of the inspirational side, so that's a purpose. When I'm shooting my own work, I try to connect it with something else. So go back to the Gert by C project, big project. As a child, I remembered hearing uh, one of Australia's national songs, which is now the national anthem, and one of the lines says, Australians all let us rejoice for we are young and free. With golden soil and wealth will toil, our home is girt by sea. And I always wondered what girt meant. It was a strange word. It's certainly not an Aussie word. I discovered that the national anthem had been written by a Scotsman. And the word girt means, it is associated with girth. Uh, girt means surrounded by. So girt by sea, surrounded by water. So I wanted to share with people what girt by sea meant through visual poetry, through images of the coast. So I had a purpose, and it's that purpose that drove that project through the difficult times, you know, 12 months of logistical planning, massive budget, sponsorship, etc., to do this thing, and then a big exhibition and book. So all of that requires energy, focus, time, commitment. Purpose is what helped drives that. Now, there are some amazing photographers on the planet doing things for conservation, uh, animal welfare, finding a purpose that you can connect your work to so that your imagery is giving a voice to something that needs to be heard. That's one way for me that can keep you going. Sharing your passion and what you've learned along the way means that you can help other voices be heard. And there's a plenty of room for all of us. You know, I'm, I'm not worried about <laughs> sharing what I know because no one's ever going to be me. And nor would I want them to be. I want them to be the best version of who they are. So helping them do that is a purpose. And photography is kind of the, it's the road that we're taking. It's the, it's the boat that we're in while we do what we do. So for me, photography is not the end game. It's just a vehicle in which I get to be and do what I am. Uh, and I would perhaps suggest to people, whether it's through your NFTs, whether it's through books, whether it's through standing on stage and sharing your knowledge, um, your unique experience as you move through the world and your special ability and superpower of being able to see and then translate that vision through photography, through image capture and present it in ways that people can sit and enjoy and be seduced into and then start looking deeper into. That's your way of saying something. Find something important and say it. Love it. What about different ways to say that something important, right? So today we've been talking about, uh, you know, the two dimensional, you know, static photograph for the most part. Of course, there's video as well. As, as we move into sort of this Web3 NFT world, there's the uh, ability to create unique works that are animated, like through cinemagraphs and you know, things like that, or even attaching a soundscape to a photo, you know, to give it more dimension. Where do you fall on that? Are, do you fall on the, the, the traditionalist side of it where, you know, is a photograph is a photograph, it's X and Y, we're going to do our processing and boom, that's it. Or on the, the other side of it where it's, you know, let's, multi, let's become multimediographers and merge the, the mediums to tell the story at hand. I don't know. Where, where do you fall on that? Well, first of all, I love that word multimediographers and I'm going to use it if that's okay. <laughs> hey, go ahead. That. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, I made it up. It's all yours to use. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We'll start that one. That's a trend. Multimediographers. That's awesome. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I want to say how much I respect photographers who choose to stay within the boundaries of, you know, classic traditional aspects of photography, you know, print, um, keeping it simple. But I will not be confined by boundaries. And I feel that, you know, some of the, some of the classic photographers of last century, given the opportunity to be in this century, they'd be forging ahead and breaking new ground. I, for me, you know, I can, the same principles that apply to a black and white photojournalistic shot from 75 years ago that would move people, create emotion, um, create 
movements, you know, because masses of people would see this picture and, and, and be angry or be inspired or be um, motivated. The same thing can be done with, with multimedia imagery. It still comes back to seeing something. And one of the things I've learned over the years is that, I, and you touched on it earlier, Frederick, that our experience of seeing something is influenced by what we hear, what, what we feel at the same time. So, you know, taking a picture of a sunset on a warm tropical beach where the temperature's, you know, let's say it's you know, a, a balmy 70 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, uh, with just a, a light breeze, uh, the trees are slowly moving, you know, just that little bit of movement, and you, you're experiencing a beautiful sunset, is different to being on the same beach in winter with the wind howling through and the temperatures may be only 24 degrees <laughs> and it's freezing. And it might be just as much a beautiful sunset, but we have a different experience. Now, if we can tap into or, or touch the other senses, see, the thing about, uh, about our brain is I'm stepping out, of, stepping around a bit here. So yeah. first of all, we don't we don't see with our eyes. We see with our brain. Our eyes are a capture device. They're like a lens. They are a lens. They basically take the information in, and then we process that information within our brain. So we're seeing with our brain, and we're seeing based on what our brain has is able to process, and that's built on what we've experienced through life. So. If we can tap into other senses and they contribute to that processing of information, then we have a more rounded understanding of what we're looking at. Yeah. And multimedia, uh, AR, uh, you know, A AR, um, VR, all of these things that allow us to use other senses while we're experiencing or seeing something only open up more of the experience itself. So for me... I'm super excited. Now, you know, uh, light, the light art drop, the, the um, Alpha Collection, mm -hmm. is my first foray into NL, uh, um, NFTs. I have been looking at NFTs for about a year. I've been fairly busy with my own exhibitions through, through the gallery that represents me here, my coaching, my mentoring, but I've had my eye on it, and every now and then I'd get a bit closer and go, gosh, this is such a, a massive world. I'm not going to rush into it. I'd like to rush into it, but... I just want to learn as much as I can. And, you know, when Elia Lacardi invited me to, to uh, submit some images, I was super excited because I, this is a great for me, way for me to get into the community. And what excites me the most is uh, this is an area where all the senses can be involved, even though they might be carried by the sense of sight. And that might be the way we step into this experience, but there can be other things involved. And when we look at a picture, as you identified earlier, looking at a photograph in the middle of a desert in a sandstorm is different to sitting in a warm lounge with a glass of wine and looking at the same image and given the opportunity for our brain to explore it using other senses. And memory comes into it. Yeah, um, memory so is essentially a collection of senses. So our memories, and this is stepping into things called NLP. don't know if you've come across that terminology. Yeah, neuro-linguistic programming, right? Yeah, so I studied NLP for about six years and, and went to an advanced level in that. But wow. you know, essentially in NLP, our memories are, you know, we go back to our memory and it's a collection of sights, sounds, tastes, smells, you know, um, mm -hmm. and feelings. So a picture, and this is the fascinating thing, we pick up a photo. You know, you go back to the old days, not so much now, but there, there are those out there that may have the shoebox in the, in the closet with all the little pictures that from when they were you know, younger. Or it might be on your computer, you're looking for something and you come across an old folder, you open it up. And we get trapped. We get trapped for hours because we start unlocking these memories. And it's not the single image that grabs us. It's the, it's the doorway that the image becomes. And it's like a, remember the old zip files? You take a zip file, you send one file, you, you unzip it and open it, and there's all of this stuff inside it. Mm -hmm. So we look at a photograph from the past and suddenly it unlocks memories. And those memories are experienced as feelings. We might hear a song. We might even smell the kitchen smells or that that tropical breeze on that beach in the balmy, balmy sunset. So I think we're now moving into a space where we can offer people a more rounded experience, albeit through a portal of, of, of an image, but, um, uh, you know, with accessories around it, if you like, of audio, yeah. of kinesthetic movement, you know, uh, some of the, the AR stuff where you get that 
that sort of um, movement that comes with it. You know, look at a cinema. We went and saw the latest Top Gun movie recently, and you know, my, I said to my wife, I don't want to see that on the TV yet. I want to see it in a movie cinema because yeah. the, the audio is going to move you. You know, you're going to physically be moved by the sound waves, and and it's going to be a more all round experience. And I think that's what we can bring them. I love that. I love that. And that's, I want to see personally, just as a, a consumer of imagery, I want to see more of that where, you know, I'm brought, even if it's just an audio scape or, or some, some background sound, you know, or something, I want to be transported into that photograph and into what the artist was feeling. And we can do that now with audio. Yeah. I mean, with, with, with multimedia, most of, most images are consumed on a phone or a tablet or a computer anyway, which can play audio. So you know, why are most photographs mute, right? <laughs> they should talk a little, I think, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, and, and I think people, well, my, my invitation is to not worry about whether you're a classic photographer who's not interested in multimedia, adding audio, etc., or you're somebody who loves the idea of augmenting your presentation with music, with other things, Either way, you know, all of us have a voice. Let's use it and let's share it and let's listen to what everyone else has to say. Let's see what everyone else wants to show us and let's try to step into each of their experiences because it's only going to enrich our own. Yeah. You know, I want to I wanna wrap up. There was one question I wanted to get in there uh, before we end and I'll wrap up with this one and it's about specialization, uh, you know, it, or choosing a genre and sticking to it. Remember the, the, I'm hoping you can either confirm or challenge the conventional wisdom that in order to be good at something, you got to be good and known for that one thing. And, you know, I am the world's best fashion photographer and that's what I'm known as, or I'm Ansel Adams and I'm the landscape black and white guy, or, you know, on and on and on. Can photographers be pan genre or should they focus on one and become known uh, in synonymous with that one genre? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, I believe you can be either. Uh, some would call, I don't see anything wrong with being a generalist, but I, you know, if somebody said you can only do one type of photography going forward, I'm at my happiest. You know, I mean, I'm in my space when I'm above the earth looking down and looking at the shapes the color, the textures and the forms that I see spread out before me and identifying little pockets of land that I can see something that reminds me of something else and then being excited about how I could share that insight or that experience with others. So in some ways over the last say 10 to 15 years I've moved through landscape uh, into more illustrative abstract work and found myself in a place where I'm, I'm known at least in, in the area around me, um, as a fine art aerial you know, photographer. Having said that, as you identified a little bit earlier, I still shoot portrait. I still do commercial work. I still I present, I teach, I, and I, I teach on things that aren't direct photography, but I'll use photography to, to share that. So I, my answer would be I think you've got more important is to be true to yourself. If you force yourself into one genre, and you don't want to be there, then you won't be happy. And if you're not happy, I don't believe you're going to produce your best work. But if you force yourself to stay diverse and you really just love one thing, then I also feel you won't get the best out of yourself. There is a couple of um, caveats. If you're doing this as a living and you're starting out, uh, perhaps you do have to be more of a generalist. If you live in a small town, you might have to be the wedding photographer who also shoots the headshots for the local businesses and... Um, you know, covers portraits for the school, and then you get to sell a few landscape pictures into the local gallery. But if you move past that and you've got to the point where you're not dependent on taking everything you have to to work, or you're a photographer like many these days who has a, a second career or first career and, and shooting photos for yourself is kind of the bonus, um, then I'd say whatever makes you happiest. And if what makes you happy is being a journalist, be a generalist and be good at it. And you can be one of the best generalists around or be a specialist and get known for that. And perhaps that will get you cut through. There's no question if you're the best, if you stay doing one thing for and, and focus on it, you will become better at it. But there's no reason you can't become good at everything. 
and um, what was I going to say? It's gone out of my head. Uh, yeah, like being, it's gone out yeah, of my like, head. But being no, what, just to piggyback on what you're saying, being you know, there's the you know, there. Tell me what you think of this. There's the whole idea of uh, when you're when you're attempting something difficult. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. You've heard that, right? And then the other other side of that coin is yes, but the incorrect definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So those things are diametrically opposed, right? So what, yeah. you know, yeah. how do you I, reconcile? Look, I, I, think, I, I agree with you, but I think it's it it should be expanded to if you keep doing keep doing the same thing you'll get and getting the same results as the definition of insanity if you keep doing the same thing the same way yeah you'll get the same yeah. results but if you keep doing the same thing but keep trying different ways then i think that's that's the um principles of science that's the principles of exploration that's the principles of you know genius really yeah. is yeah. jumping laterally you want one of the i want to just point out that well, specialization, and I understand why people prefer that. And I, and I remembered years ago, someone said to me, some advice given to me about 30 years ago in my career was, you're trying to do too many different things. Just pick one and do it well. And I thought, okay, that's great advice. Now, the person who gave me that advice did a lot of different things and still does. And I said to them one day, I couldn't adhere to that. And they said, I'm glad you didn't because you've got other talents. Um, I think it's in, in uh, super important that we understand Whatever we choose to do, as long as we commit to it, that's the most important thing. And one of the greatest values of trying different things outside your specialty is what that brings to your specialty. So I believe that having shot a thousand weddings in another life and having shot thousands of portraits, that has helped my landscape photography. My understanding of light, because shooting those wedding photographers that are out there will understand how much you have to learn about um, working with all sorts of conditions, all sorts of lighting conditions, all sorts of weather conditions, and being able to adapt uh, and create something no matter what, because the day is the day is the day. It can't change. Now, when you're out shooting landscape and the day is not what you wanted it to be, the weather didn't show the way, the sunrise isn't what you expected, you have the ability to go, well, okay, what have I got to work with? So you can still focus on your specialty, but when we step outside of that, we can learn a hell of a lot. Now, I'm more inspired by looking through surfing magazines, um, uh, you know, fashion magazines and things like that than I am looking through landscape magazines. I love going to artist exhibitions more than photography exhibitions because I look at the way people, artists paint. Now, I, you know, I've just started talking to an artist about collaborating on a workshop. She paints water. Now, I love photographing water, and her fascination is with water and light. My fascination is with water and light. I don't want to become a painter who paints, although I'll probably get an interest in it, but I want to understand the philosophy and the process that a painter of the ocean and the seascapes, what do they go through? Because when I'm editing, I can maybe improve the way I approach that. So my short answer is specialise or generalise whatever is keeping you passionate and inspired but if you do specialize every now and then stepping over here is going to contribute to the enhancement of your specialty skills yeah so much it's so much it's so the 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 art of photography and the psychology behind photography the business of photography the marketing of photography the you know all these things sort of they're they're like planets around a sun of photography like there's so much to know about and and dive into and you just you just touched on a couple of them in this this one hour discussion that we've had <laughs> and any one of those you could just dive deep you know and just yeah. you know get inspired about photography both from a from a creator standpoint and from a, a collector or purchaser or consumer of photography yeah. you know to understand what goes into these works I think adds another layer of dimension to their worth. So thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, I think you're welcome. I, I, I think, you know, if I was, if I'm in an exhibition, for instance, and someone's looking at a piece of work, one of the things that, that pleases me the most is somebody standing there looking at it and maybe having an emotional response. And I've seen that many times. They'll have an emotional response and, and you might say, well, you know, how are you going? You know, how are you feeling about that? And they say, look, I realize that in this moment, 
I'm seeing the culmination of a whole journey that you've been on, that you've brought all of this experience to this one moment and then you've captured it and you brought it to us with your own voice and I'm standing here and it's connected with me. And I, I you know, that brings me to tears sometimes because that's the whole goal. I want somebody to stand there and feel something. And if they look at, whether it's a physical piece, NFT, if they look at it and they go, you know, they're scanning through and they stop, wow, what's that? That's connecting with them at a level that maybe logically they don't understand. And that's the beauty. We only communicate by, we communicate with our words only 7%. Um, tonality of our voice, the up and down, is 38%. Our body language, 55%. So with pictures, if you can capture some something more than just this is what it looks like, then you're opening up and diving. You talked about diving deep a few times. You're diving into that person's psyche. And then you have this connection between you and the viewer that goes far beyond what's on the face of the picture. And it actually helps the picture. That's what the picture's for. It is that window or connection, nexus, between my experience of the world and yours. And if I've been able to connect with you through my imagery, then I hope to have enriched your experience of the world. And interestingly enough, when we see something that captures our attention, it unlocks areas in our brain that helps us to experience our own world outside of that picture in new ways. And that fascinates me. And that's something I want to contribute to. I love it. Love it. Uh, Tony Hewitt, if people want to connect with you, um, they want to see what you're working on next uh, or otherwise interact with you, what's the, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Look, um, you go to the website, TonyHewitt.com. Uh, you'll certainly see a little bit of what I do and what I'm about. Um, you can email me, Tony at TonyHewitt.com if there's any questions. Instagram, Tony.Hewitt, you'll see a little bit of me there. There's a few other social media platforms. I do travel. Um, I'm in the States next year a couple of times. I think there's a couple of conferences I've been invited to be part of. So I am around the place. But certainly socials, you'll, you'll get a bit of a heads up of what I'm doing. And I do workshops, you know, here overseas. Overseas for me is Northern Hemisphere or, you know, other parts in the Southern Hemisphere. So, yeah, I, I anything I can help with, I do a lot of coaching and mentoring, whether one-on-one -on -one or whether it's in group sessions. We do mastermind group every year. So, yeah, I'm around. And... Hopefully, Frederick, you and I get to chat again because I've had a lot of fun and yeah, there's always something to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy you a beer anytime and, and binge your ear with <laughs> photography ideas. <laughs> Where, whereabouts are you? You're in I'm in, I'm in Northern California. Yeah, Northern California up here. It's adjacent. I'm Bay Area adjacent. So if you're okay, familiar beautiful. with the San Francisco Bay Area, I am. I'm, I'm in the outer orbit of that place. <laughs> so. Uh, yes, I've been to San Francisco many times and it, it's, it's a beautiful city. It's actually reminds me a lot of Perth and Sydney, you know, like it's got that same feel, that West Coast feel that I'm, I'm used to. And Perth yeah. is quite a remote area. But, uh, you know, as I said, I love the water. As I'm near the water, I'm a happy man. There you go. Yeah, we're, we're near the water, definitely. The Pacific is our <laughs> friend out here. Uh, great. Tony, you, you've been fantastic. Thank you, sir, for coming on. I My appreciate pleasure. it. Yeah, this is, like I said, I, I literally have a, a page full of notes. I think I got through one sixteenth of it you know to, <laughs> so. well well can i make a comment there that it's one of the things i think is fascinating is you and i just chatted for an hour and we didn't really talk technical we didn't mention f-stops apertures shutter speeds i think you might have mentioned maybe once we didn't talk about cameras we didn't talk about photoshop and i'd like to encourage people to remember that photography starts here and we, this is the most important tool you've got over and above your cameras, your software, your computers. The rest of it's there just to do your bidding. Love it. Tony Hewitt, thank you. And uh, we will be in touch. We will speak again, my friend. <laughs> Their pleasure. Absolutely loved have, uh, be being here and uh, a real honor to talk with you, Frederick. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for listening. Have a great day. Huh?